Welcome to the Everything Coworking Podcast. This is your host, Jamie Russo. Thank you for joining me. For those of you who are watching on video and our YouTube channel is getting more and more popular. So for those of you who join us on YouTube, thank you. Um, I'm wearing my Burlingame AYSO sweatshirt. Uh, one of the hats that I wear is I am the regional commissioner for our local AYSO region. That is a three-year commitment. And in year two, I sort of feel like I might know what I'm doing. <laughs> we'll see. Um, and we're supposed to have a board meeting tonight because we tried last week and the power was out in our town. So we did not have quorum, uh, a quorum. I learned that it's a quorum when I got corrected by Grammarly in my email. So we're trying again tonight, but the gentleman who is presenting, we are looking to update our end of season tournament rules, uh, does not have power. So we are having some crazy storms, lots of wind, lots of rain. So anyway, kind of a crazy night. Hopefully you can't hear the weather. Hopefully my microphone is uh, giving me good audio. Okay. So Last week on the podcast, we talked about this idea that the best business models are known prescriptions for known problems. And we talked about why the co working business is easier if you are in a market where folks know that co working is a solution and you have a product mix that is weighted on offices, meeting rooms, and mail. Generally, those products solve a problem that people know they have and are searching for solutions to solve. Did I say that right? Um, tongue, tongue twisting here. So a challenge, you know, the laundromat is an easy business because not the laundromat. Yeah, the laundromat or the dry cleaner. I was really thinking about the dry cleaner, although that's probably a terrible business post COVID. You know, you know, if you need something dry cleaned, you can't do it at home. So how do I get something dry cleaned? I Google dry cleaner near me. Uh, I solve a problem. I can find the solution. I know it's a problem. We went through lots of this last week, so I'm not going to repeat it again. The challenge with anything besides the private office, the uh, business identity packages and meeting rooms is that those products like a dedicated desk or flex desk or hot desk or whatever we call them, you call them in your business. Those are products that um, generally the co-working business made up as an alternative to the office for people that don't really need an office and don't want to pay for an office. So if you don't value an office, you don't want to pay the price that we assign to a private office. So we assign lower price and value to open space or dedicated desk. So we sort of invented those products for folks as an alternative, which works great if you're in a market where people know enough about co-working to show up looking for a solution and say, oh yeah, I could use a dedicated desk or I could use a flex desk or know enough about co-working and feel like it addresses a problem that they have and they're on your website and they understand what those products are and they join. And that happens all the time, right? If you're listening and you have a co-working space, you have sold all of those products. The challenge is you may not be selling enough of them. And this is more of a challenge post COVID. So I work with over a hundred operators through our community manager program, through our operator membership, through our co-working startup school, although our co-working startup school members don't quite you know, know the challenges yet. They're about to get into them, but we talk about these with them because they want to get in front of these challenges, right? And that's the advantage they have for taking the startup school is they learn from all of you that have gone before them. So we talk about these challenges all the time. Post COVID, it is easier to sell offices. It is harder to sell dedicated desks and flex desks. There are exceptions. You may know or be one of those operators that has no problem selling these products. But what I often hear is phrases like, well, you know, we just can't fill more than half of our dedicated desks at a time. Or, you know, we have a lot of capacity in our co working area and it feels really quiet and we're having trouble filling it and it's a chicken or egg problem. Or just, you know, people are really hesitant. They're on Zoom calls. They think they need an office. It's hard to talk them into a dedicated desk or a co working desk. Um, and, Part of that is the the sheer numbers of people who come in. If you track, um, and I'm hosting a session on KPIs at Juicy, 
So um, ping me on Instagram, getting our DMs on Instagram, or just, you know what, you can send us an email. Um, I don't spend a lot of time on social media as I don't encourage you to. I probably should spend more time on it, but uh, just send us an email. Um, you can send it at to hello at everythingcoworking.com. And we have a discount code for our loyal listeners. So if you're thinking about going to Juicy and would like a discount, um, little side tangent, but my session is on KPIs and you just reminded me that I need to do some prep calls for that panel. So if you are paying attention to your KPIs, one of the things that you're tracking is how many tours are coming in and what product they're interested in and what the conversions rate rates look like on those products. So it is likely that you have a lot more tours coming in for private offices than you do dedicated desks or co-working. It is also likely that your conversion rate is higher if you're tracking by product type for offices, because again, it's a known problem. People know there's a solution out there and they've budgeted for it and it's probably less of a discretionary budget. So folks that need offices probably need them to run their businesses. So if there's an economic downturn, if gas prices go up, if there's inflation, all the things we're dealing with now, they're not as likely to drop their offices. And maybe you've got them in a year-long commitment. But dedicated desks and co-working, that's a harder sale because those are discretionary choices. People are don't need those, right? That Those are, are more optional. And so it, they can be harder to sell when the economy is not booming. And that is the time period we're in now. So I don't have all of the answers. So I should <laughs> just confess that right away. But what I do have is the ability to facilitate this conversation um, and share some thoughts that um, I have based on the conversations that I'm a part of and share things that I see other folks doing or um, salute, you know, some ideas that people are sharing. So I think it's important that we figure out a forum to have these conversations. We do those. We certainly do that in our operator membership. We'd love to have you join us. You can find that on our website under work with us. So here are some thoughts that I have with this challenge of selling products that solve problems that people don't necessarily know they have. First, if you haven't opened a space yet, focus on the solutions that people know exist. So build more private spaces, rely less on dedicated desks and co-working. I'm not saying you know, build a model that you don't want to run, but build a model that provides solutions that consumers are buying. And I think we talked a lot about that on the first episode, the previous episode, but I just wanted to, I thought it was worth repeating. So the next step is if you have filled your offices and now you're an existing operator, you have dedicated desks and co-working spaces. Okay. So you, what are the levers that you can pull to sell more of those desks. So first I would say, if you've tried all the things and they're not working and it's been months and you're not seeing any change in net new memberships for those products, it may be that that's not going to change for a while. Coworking can be cyclical, um, but we are, so we should be coming into an upturn in sales. So holidays are typically a tricky time. People don't make a lot of decisions, but starting January, February, March, April, those should be really strong months. And then summer is going to be challenging again. And then fall typically in, in this is sorry, in us seasons. I know we have, um, friends down under listening who are in completely opposite seasons. So seasons matter, you know, alignment with school year matters. Um, but outside of, of those factors, if you are not improving your conversions and your net new members, meaning like that number is ticking up um, every month and not sort of staying the same or going down, then it may be that these products just are not going to work for your market unless there's some lever that you haven't pulled yet. And we can talk about that in a minute. I think the lever that is probably left is not an easy one. I do speak with folks who have actual marketing holes, funnel holes, um, you know, that aren't doing all the right marketing things and do have challenges in their sales funnels. If that is you, then you're lucky because that is probably fixable. If you're pretty savvy and you've been doing this for a while, then you may just need to be realistic about the contribution that those products are going to make 
to your revenue and to your profit. And you may need to write them off, essentially. That is kind of what I would do as a business owner. I would, I'm not saying give up, but I'm saying if you rely on that revenue to pay your mortgage, send your kids to gymnastics class, <laughs> um, that, that would be me um, in terms of the fees that I pay to the local gymnastics class. I want you to think about, okay, maybe that re we're not going to see that revenue. So maybe you have to look at that as bonus revenue. Again, don't give up on it. Um, you could convert that space into offices. That depends on your real estate model, the length of your lease, access to cash to do that. So that's one option. Take the space and create more private spaces um, or refocus your effort and find some other way to generate that income, either within your business by building your mail program, focusing on meeting room revenue, or outside of your business. A lot of folks don't only do co-working. So you likely had some profession before this, do some consulting, um, you know, start a side hustle. I don't mean to, you know, say this, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, you know, throw this out sort of lightly, but I always had other roles when I was a co-working space operator. I did consulting and I had two locations. I was still doing consulting. I ran the Global Workspace Association while operating spaces. I started my co-working startup school while running my co-working spaces. So I always had other ways to generate revenue. And I think it's good to diversify. So it may be time to just simply be realistic that you're having a hard time selling those products. And let's talk just for a couple of minutes about why that is, which I think will shift into, you know, what's the lever that's left for you to try if you think your sales funnel and, and your marketing is really on point. I think the mental dissonance that we're having right now is that there's a lot of industry discussion, a lot of Kool-Aid drinking out there. Um, and I'm sure I'm guilty of that when which is why sometimes I just, I just want to break it down and say, look, sometimes we just need to be realistic and write that off. So the industry Kool-Aid is there, you know, like, like anybody who there's so many more people today who have a choice around where they're going to work. Not everyone, right? There are plenty of people who need to be in a physical location, but so many people who used to have to go to an office somewhere who don't, have to anymore. They have a choice. Um, so we think, oh my gosh, the total addressable market, the TAM just became enormous. And all I need is this little tiny sliver of market share to make my business hit a home run. I just need, you know, 250 people, whatever the number is for you. That's not that many, right? Of all the total addressable market out there, of all the people who could work at my co-working space and make that choice, some of them would be paying out of pocket. Some of them might have a stipend. Some are remote workers. Some are small businesses giving up leases. Where are all of these people that could come take my co-working memberships and my dedicated desks? They must be out there. I think they all are. They are out there. But the challenge is, there, there are a few challenges. One is not everybody's going to get it paid for. I do think that's happening more and more. So we know that the major platforms like DeskPass, Liquid Space, um, Upflex, it's, you know, Dasana, et cetera, they are doing deals with corporations and selling access to their platforms and the corporations are paying. We we know this is happening and some of you are seeing in that, that in your space. It's probably... Um, skewed towards specific markets. So if you're in a small market, maybe you're not seeing very much of that action. And also that's a major change management initiative on the side of the end user who is not an entrepreneur. So I had this awesome, I think I should, I just want to zoom out for a second. I think that um, there are some other macro things happening here. And I think that as an industry, we still have a lot of work to do around understanding our consumer and what motivates them and what gets them to make a decision around joining a space. Or, or because that behavior, I think, was so easy and clear and obvious when we were mostly focusing on entrepreneurs or startups, or it used to be that we really were focusing on supporting like 
professional services, accountants, lawyers, people who, you know, have the income and a clear need for an office. That's just what they do. Attorneys go to an office. Accountants go to an office. Startups go to an office, right? And they still generally do, but that doesn't drive growth, right? The growth comes from all the small businesses giving up leases and all the remote employees that might become co-working users, uh, maybe not full-time, but meeting room, drop-ins, et cetera. So again, some of that is happening, but the the there's a lot of change management that has to get done and behavior change for that to happen. So I have been talking about this with a lot of folks and I think some of the insights. So I had a conversation over the weekend, Mara Hauser's daughter's fiance's aunt <laughs> gave me a ride home from the mountain because we went skiing and um, we got a flat tire on the way and my husband had to take the car to get uh, two new tires, which is always a treat. And so we needed a ride home. My daughter and I did. So she gave us a ride home and we just completely nerded out on consumer insights and research around co-working. Um, and she is a consumer insights professional. She worked for Nike and some other companies, and that's like her area of expertise. And she's super interested in co-working. So we just went to town. And then I've had a bunch of conversations with operators about um, I had one today and I won't, you know, say his name, but I'll give him credit if he, if he wants me to give him credit. But, you know, he said a couple of things. One is like, it can feel like you're the new kid, it, you know, at a high school when you join a co-working space. And I actually just joined a co-working space last week. And that's exactly how I feel. I feel kind of awkward. And I owned co-working spaces for eight years in two different markets. And I run a po co-working podcast and still... I feel like the new kid and I am going to do a separate podcast for my um, academy operator members and talk about that experience. I really enjoy the space, so I'm not picking on the space at all. I'm just saying, I think that's a really normal feeling and I hadn't articulated it like that. Um, but I've talked to Mark Gilbreth from Liquid Space and we probably talked about this on the podcast we did together recently, you know, that folks need to get out of their comfort zone and be pretty motivated to go into a co-working space, they've never used one before. They don't know how it works. They don't know how you're supposed to behave. I kind of felt that way today. I actually had to go down to the space because um, my my power went out and I had you know calls all day and I couldn't take the calls because I couldn't get online. So I hustled down to the co-working space and I had some logistical errors in booking meeting rooms and the meeting rooms were full and I had to take a call in the lobby and just like and. The, the space has eight room phone booths. It is stacked with phone rooms and they were all busy. Um, so anyway, I had some like awkward moments. It was raining. I had my coat. I didn't know where to put my coat. You know, at some point later in the day, I saw somebody open this mystery closet that was the coat closet. And I was like, oh my God, there's a coat closet here. No one told me. So just like these little awkward things. Um, I keep running into people like walking around corners and I don't know who they are. And so we do this awkward like, oh, sorry, you know, so that will change. I know. But anyway, I should be super comfortable in a co-working space. And even I have those like awkward feelings and it's not enough to keep me from going, but um, so that insight and this idea that most people don't know what to do in a co-working space. Oh, the other thing that the um, the co-working space owner who said who had the insight about feeling like high school also said that um, he also one of his um, team members had talked to somebody who said, "I'm not cool enough to work there." Probably she has like a normal corporate job and thought co-working spaces are for entrepreneurs and I am not an entrepreneur and therefore I will not fit in. Wow. What an insight, right? So that is probably a thought that more than one person is having. That may be a theme. We don't know because we don't do market research. Um, I would love for the association to do market research. And I might have said this last time. But I would also really, really, really love for the association to do the Got Milk campaign. I think there's so much work to do around awareness, which is what I'm kind of going to get to next. I keep talking about this theme. I think that it is really challenging to be in a market where folks are not co-working aware and they don't identify with a problem that is solved by co-working. So um I talked in my email newsletter this week about my own personal sort of breakdown 
um, that made me say, I, I really just have to get out of the house. I hadn't identified a co-working space nearby that I wanted to join. There just aren't that many in my market. And the one that I really wanted to join is 30 minutes away, which is an hour out of my day. And I am an Enneagram three and I'm very focused on being efficient. And that is a lot of time out of my day. But I finally like went through this whole ROI conversation in my head about the use of that time and how important it was for me to leave the house, how important it is to my mindset and my happiness. And all those things are true, but even I had to have that pep talk with myself. And so think about people who just don't even know about co-working and can't identify. So I had this, you know, just like moment of like, you know, uh, you know, the last straw or whatever, you know, I was telling my husband, like, I just feel, um, bland and I feel, I'm trying to remember what the other words I put it in my newsletter, the word, the words that I used, you know, I just don't feel like myself when I'm at home all the time. And I think lots of people feel that way, but they don't know that it's a problem that should be solved and can be solved by co-working. They just don't know. Um, uh, and the thing, so one of the arguments you might be having is, well, I had co-working members or I had dedicated desk members before the pandemic and now they're gone. And I think that is partly because behavior change is also hard. So all those people that you had before went home and they made nice home offices. I have a really nice home office. It's really nice. It was a guest room. And at some point during COVID, I said, we, I don't mean it's like ridiculously fancy. I just mean um, we, I think I talked about this on a previous podcast. I use this awesome app. They're no longer in business. It was called Modzi and they pick the paint colors and I have a couch in my office at home and I have it all set up for my zoom calls. I will tell you, I was a complete disaster on all my zoom calls today because I have not figured out like the lighting and all the accessories I need when I go to the co-working space, but it takes a lot of like energy to break out of the inertia that we have from being at home. So that is a human behavior challenge that is probably the real problem for all of the folks that used to be members and now are not. And so how do you make a case to them to get their butts out of their home offices and back into the co-working space? If they're the kind of consumer whose mind you can shift. So I'll contrast myself um, to my husband. My husband works in finance. He works for a company. It's not a huge company. Um, ha you know, probably half the company's remote. He's certainly remote. He works at home. And I said, I am joining a co-working space. I have to leave the house every day. And he said, I do not. I'm staying at home and I'm very happy here. <laughs> He's like, it would make no sense to me for me to, to leave the house and drive and sit on Zoom calls all day because that's mostly what he does. He's on, you know, Zoom calls all day. And he, like his mindset, nothing about his routine to him would be any better if he did it at co-working space. Giovanni and I did an um, interview with a gentleman who is the chief operating officer of asset management for Madison Marquette. That is a mouthful. And I think I got it right. And he homes, he doesn't homeschool. His wife homeschools their five daughters. And he was so, he's so happy to be at home. He does all his work at home. He loves being at home with the family. He doesn't waste commute time. He can have lunch with them, dinner with them, you know, et cetera. No problem that he has no like mindset, mojo, productivity. Nope. He's good at home. So there's just this whole segment of people who are good at home. You cannot change their mind. You cannot talk them into joining your dedicated desk and your co-working. But there are people whose minds you can change. So the challenge is, is how do we do that? They are not searching for you. This is the challenge, right? With selling our co-working and dedicated desk memberships. They are not on Google Googling for you because they don't know that you exist and they don't know that the problems they have of loneliness, lack of productivity, you know, distractions, don't have any mojo, feel kind of blah, 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 you know, all the like kind of phrases and mindset challenges that we could identify. They they don't know that those are solvable problems and that they could solve by joining a co-working community. And so they're not looking. And so you have to get in front of them. And what I think is really challenging is that that kind of work is, I don't think really meant for a small business to tackle. Uh, but 
you, the co-working space owner, have decided that you're passionate about this business and passionate about serving your members and attracting your members. And now you have co-working and dedicated desk memberships that maybe are challenging to sell. And so I don't know who's going to do it. Again, I would love for the association to do it. So did we talk about the Got Milk campaign? I grew up on a dairy farm uh, in the 90s-ish. I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but the Got Milk campaign was huge when I was a kid. Um, and I had was involved in the dairy promotion board. I won't tell you in what way, unless you do one of those, you know, two truths and a lie games with me. And then it usually comes up because it's a good one. So the American Dairy Association paid for that campaign. They you know, all the uh, dairy farmers pay, you know, or if they're members, they pay into the association. So the association said the thing we can do to be helpful is convince people that drinking milk is good for them. And it worked because if you grew up at the same time that I grew up, you know, you know, you remember the, um, the guy with the peanut butter, who the, the uh, Aaron Burr <laughs> trivia uh, ad and all sorts of good ones. I mean, I had all the got milk t-shirts when I was a kid. So that campaign taught people why milk is good for you. Parents, right? Moms. It was there, it existed to make sure that moms knew that your kids need calcium and vitamin D to make healthy bones and teeth and all those things. Um, and it was very successful. And we need that type of education in the co-working industry for the average consumer who's open to this messaging. It's hard for the independent operator to do that. So uh, I don't know what the answer is to that. Some independent operators are going to tackle this on their own. And here's what I would make super, super clear. Again, this is not a Google ad solution because Google ads are um, work when people are actively searching for something. It's well, and there's some changes to that, but we'll let, we'll let Ruben um, come on and talk about that. Facebook, though, is generally Facebook slash Instagram is interrupting people, right? So I got um, an email from the Bull Moose Club today. I'm on their email distribution list. They're in Albany, New York. And the subject line was the Bull Moose Club is your solution for isolation. And I was like, that is exactly what I mean. So you have to already be interested in co-working because you're already on their email list. So it's not the perfect example. But what if that was a Facebook ad? Then somebody who I would use words that people use. The average consumer is not going to use the word isolation. They're going to say I'm lonely um, or, you know, I feel like I, maybe they use the word community. I think that's a word we use more. So we'd have to do the research to really figure out like what words are the consumers using and and identifying with. So maybe it's isolation, but I loved it. They're not saying we sell dedicated desks for you. We say it's the, the Bull Moose Club said it's your solution for isolation. Yes, we need more of that messaging because it's connecting the dot for the person who doesn't think they need an office. But hey, what you do need is, is a membership. You know, come work here and you won't be so isolated. So we need more awareness advertising. Um, the Consumer Insights woman um, that I, hold on, I'm looking at her name. I think it's Sarah, that I was uh, with this weekend. She, I was like, what would you do? And she said, definitely Facebook ads. And she said, I would test a quiz. I would test a quiz that uses the language that people identify with, like, um, you know, productivity, loneliness, whatever it is. Like, um, I can't remember. Anyway, I can't remember the details of what we talked about. I would die, would love to get her on the podcast to talk about this. But basically, you know, you're scrolling through your Facebook or Instagram feed and there's a quiz that you can take. And then the outcome is a recommendation that says you should join your local co-working space to solve this, you know, distracted problem or eating at home problem or, you know, whatever challenge people are having that they don't know can be solved by a co-working space. So how do you lure them in with the symptom that they might recognize and connect the dots for them that co-working solves that problem. The same operator that was giving me the awesome insights today about um, feeling like you're in high school and you know co-working spaces are too cool for me also said they've been working on um, a campaign that they're going to run on Facebook ads, connecting the dots for people about how you use a co-working space. So don't assume people know, right? If they know, they're Google searching for you and they've found you. Um, but if they don't know, you have to tell them. So They've done a lot of um, analog 
connecting those dots like sidewalk signs and flyers. Now they're going to do it digitally. So um, we did have the conversation. It is not a great idea to run your own Facebook ads without becoming really, really educated in how they work because you're not going to succeed if you don't know how they work and probably have some coaching. I totally get their exp it's expensive to hire a Facebook ads manager. It feels especially wonky in our industry because if you're in a market, if you're in a smaller market where people are not aware, then you're not going to be able to spend very much on Facebook ads. You're going to spend much more on the management of the ads, which is like always this frustrating dynamic. Uh, but I would encourage you if you want to sort of take the bull by the horns and take on this education effort, then find a Facebook ads manager that you trust or take a really good class and practice and test and play the long game. So this is not going to be a silver bullet where you run ads for a few weeks and all of a sudden everybody in town's like, I got it. I'm lonely or distracted. I'm coming to the co-working space. That's probably not going to happen. It's going to be a longer play where you have to just kind of stay in front of them and whittle them down until they something clicks for them and they say, I got to do it. Um, because people will come up with a lot of excuses. The, the guy I was talking to today, and this is just fresh. I have great conversations with um, a lot of, of folks on this topic. And I got some great emails from folks. I asked folks to respond and they all talked about the loneliness factor and how that's the dot they connect once people are in the door, I think the challenge is how do you connect that dot for people who don't even know you exist? That's the challenge, right? Because we need people to look for us, find us, come in for a tour. So, okay, I'm going to stop here because I have to go to my soccer call. I could keep talking about this. <laughs> so again, I don't have all the answers, but I think it's super important to be realistic about what's selling and not selling. Is there something you can tweak on the product? We've talked about that before. Maybe it's the name. I was talking to this consumer insights person. I was like, do you think it's weird that we call them dedicated desk and we invented that term and consumers have no idea what that means? So I've talked about that a lot in the podcast before. Some folks are experimenting with different names. They're experimenting with making dedicated desk more pod-like. That's tweaking like the product and anything you can do to make the product more office-like then becomes a solution to a known problem. So that's positive. It doesn't solve the problem that people aren't aware, aren't connecting the dots between problems they may have and solutions. So tweaking the product or the pricing or anything like that is just challenging when people, when you don't have the demand in the first place. So, so um, if you feel like you can tackle, if there's, you know, you think you're marketing, uh, if you think your sales funnel is you know, pretty nailed down, then I think the education is the missing gap, which is a pretty big challenge for an independent operator to undertake. And I think you have to do it as at scale as you can. I think it's awesome to do um, bootstrappy things. I think if you want to make it sustainable, you're probably looking at something like a Facebook ad campaign that runs your, you know, brand awareness, education, not a super clear ROI, but something you can test. And again, just be realistic about what those products are going to contribute while you're working on those things or testing other things. You may need to look for other sources of revenue um, if you're in that situation. Or if you're expanding and, and uh, working on new locations, then you, know, you just want to be really careful about your product mix and making sure you're not oversupplying a product that folks just aren't really buying today. And look, Five years from today, three years from today, two years, who knows? We could be having a completely different conversation because this industry 100% is changing a lot all the time. And so the switch will start flipping at some point, but we don't know when that will be. We all thought maybe it would have switched by flipped. The switch would have flipped by now. And so I think some folks are feeling the sense of disappointment that their expectations are not being met. So again, I, I'm not not optimistic. I just want to be realistic about what it's going to take for this to shift. So looking forward to more conversations on this topic. If you have any insights to share, please drop us a note. We'd love to hear your thoughts or join us, of course, in our operator membership. We'd love to see you on our monthly calls.